This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog-style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics. Dare to sound different. In preparation for that, for your my interrogation here, um, <laughs> you know my favorite. I remember I was asked, um, "Would you believe Google actually produced a wonderful magazine? I don't think a physical magazine. Uh, of all people, Google did it. It was." Um, it sort of had a lot of origami in it, you know, sort of intricate um, paper design. That, I remember it must have been about 10 years ago. And uh, one of the questions they asked me in that interview, and it was the first time anybody ever asked me, what music moves you? And uh, it made me think back to the, the music that, quote, unquote, it's a bit like your first question, moved me when I was young. And uh, I, 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 had, I heard this record, I used to go to um, a, a record shop. It was called a record shop in those days, Doug Dobell's. It was in the Charing Cross Road and you could get Blue Note LP and you know, people like Miles Davis and Thelonious Monk and, and others. And I used to go and collect these Blue Notes. I've still got the collection somewhere in the house. And then there was one record there, um, a, uh, a, a 33 and a third, as it was, uh, of Jerry Mulligan and Chet Baker. And the opening track on that, on that disc was um, My Funny Valentine. Oh, yeah, and it was recorded, there were, there, were, there were several um, recordings of that. This one was in a nightclub, I think it was in Paris. And as you remember, Chet Baker, I think, died in Paris of a drug overdose when he was very young. And uh, this was a, a record. And there's a particularly sort of throaty section of that, um, not just of a trumpet, but, but of a saxophone as well, I guess. And um, it was this sort of phrase that was, and, and I remember, you know, I had it on my turntable and I would literally, so probably when I was about 14 years old, would pick up the needle and replay that just that phrase or series of phrases for hours on end <laughs> with an incredible sound. And so, I, you know, I, th I think um, the answer to your question is I was listening to that um, yesterday, I think it was, uh, in preparation for this, because that still is that, that song, and I have it on my, my iPhone, um, I have it, and there are several versions of it, actually, and um, I still don't think I found, I think it was on a Fontana, actually, it wasn't on a Blue Note, it was on a Fontana LP that, that, uh, that phrase that was stuck with me when I was 14 years old. So, um, music that moves you, uh, that would be one of them in particular. Um, lo lots of other things as well. I mean, you know, I, I did Desert Island Discs, many, many years ago. And uh, Desert Island is a really interesting program because it's sort of like, it's a like a psych on the psychoanalyst couch. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I did it with um, Kirsty Young. And what it makes, forces you to do is to pick out pieces of music that meant things to you. And um, the only piece of music they couldn't lay their hands on was um, a piece of music. You remember John Kennedy, J JFK's speech, um, ask not what uh, your country can do for you, you can do for your country. There was a rap song that was made for, uh, to that speech, and it was read on YouTube and was put on a disc or on a, a, a quote-unquote official record. And I asked the BBC to include that because, you know, we all remember just like 9-11, you all always remember where you were when you heard that JFK had been 
assassinated or RFK or Martin Luther King or whatever. And um, I was on Magdalen Bridge in Cambridge. So I wanted um, in, in 63 and I wanted to remember that being on the bridge and meeting, I remember it was a Swedish undergraduate uh, who told me that, and Simon Sharma, I was with Simon Sharma, we were walking across Magdalen Bridge and um, being told that JFK had been assassinated. So I always wanted to get that piece of music in, but they wouldn't let me have it in because they said it wasn't copyrighted. I don't know whether that was the real reason or they couldn't find it or what it was, but it was a great rap song. I don't know where you can find that um, with that phrase in it, that speech in it. So that was always, but you know, Desert Island List was great because it forced you to think about your origins. I mean, was List in there. You know, I'd obviously spent a lot of time in New York, so Englishman in New York with Sting. I mean, it made you, obviously, the Beatles track in there, and it was The Fool on the Hill. Um, that's and that's then, one of my favourite ones. That is a brilliant Yeah, and then, and then, you know, Turin, though, because, you know, of China and because of uh, Italy and Puccini. And, and the, so, they were, you know, it, it actually, it was a, it was a really, it's a really great programme, and I think it's been going for about 70 or 80 years. Uh, it's quite an extraordinary program. Um, and um, then uh, what was the best film I've ever seen? I still, Barry Lyndon uh, is, uh, is Stanley Kubrick's film, is still one of the best, if not the best that I've ever seen. Visually, it was outstanding. So I, I chose the music from that, which I think was called Sarabandi. It was a, it's a handle piece of music. So, you know, all those things. So, so actually... The answer to your question is, yeah, music does mean a lot in the context of, um, of what you do. I remember I was traveling around um, um, America with Simon Schumer in 1964 for the Democratic Convention. And uh, I had a, a, a cousin in America who was particularly precocious and, and she would always take the opportunity to play the guitar. You know, she was about eight years old and was wheeled out by, I think, my aunt to perform in front of various members of the family. And Simon and I uh, were always forced to listen to this rather precocious woman um, playing playing on her guitar or ukulele or whatever it is. And we, and we, we always, when, when she asked us what we'd like her to play, we, we said, if, we, if, if I had a hat, you remember, was it Trini Le, uh, Lopez? had that uh, song called If I Had a Hammer, and we always used to laugh about that, but I didn't have that on Desert Island. And in terms of uh, the way music is marketed uh, and is put out there, is that something that you've paid attention to, or have you always used Well, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question, because Victor Nat, who's one of our partners in Media Months, um, was really keen on uh, music. And there's some really interesting companies that specialize in, I'm gonna say manufacturing music. But there's a company called Massive Music, which is based in, in Holland, which we, we passed on as an opportunity. But it's really interesting because, you know, there is, uh, I, I think a company called Song Trader. I think Massive Music, we're gonna to get together with Song Trader, which again, are they licensed music? from uh, from the, the companies like Universal or Sony or whatever, but they also create music to order or they create electronic music. And the answer is, you know, music is such a fundamentally important part of what we do uh, and a fundamentally important part of the creative process uh, and creative execution uh, that, you know, we were sorely tempted with that, but it wasn't really as mainstream for us. I mean, whether we have to be in that business or whether we just buy in the creative service as we need it, another question. And in terms of the way that artists market their material, is that something that you notice when people are running a particular oh, yeah, absolutely. campaign yeah, no, a particularly I mean, bad one? I mean, absolutely. I mean, Spotify you know, is a very good example of you know, the marketing of music, uh, well, it's not just music, obviously it sounds sound in all its forms. Uh, but yes, no, it's it, it incredibly important. 
you know, was important in my formative years. You know, I worked for Mark McCormack, um, and one of our clients was Barry Mason, uh, who wrote the words for uh, the Del Delilah, Tom Jones's, and The Last Waltz. And he did it together with a, a, a guy called Les Reed. So Les Reed wrote music and Barry wrote the words. And I always found it quite extraordinary that, that Les got exactly, they shared the royalties equally, as I remember it. And Les got the same amount of money as Barry. So Barry became a very rich man uh, or very wealthy man on the back of Les Reed's music. And, and the other thing that was very funny about those times, which just remind, reminds me of it, uh, you know, we, we used to manage Barry's uh, royalties and money. And, of course, the, the royalties would come through the Performing as Rights Society, the PRS, and they would come, uh, they were paid in two instalments on June the 30th and December the 31st. And if you had a financial year end, you know, of December 31st, you never knew what was going to come through the letterbox in terms of royalties, uh, until literally December 31st, didn't have enough time to do anything about it from a tax minimization point of view. So those checks caused a, a lot of um, a lot of heartache and, and dyspepsia. And then there was, of course, again, it reminded me, Alan Klein, uh, who was, I think, a lawyer. You remember, he, he looked after the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. And uh, what he did was quite revolutionary in the time because the, the record companies really didn't keep an accurate uh, number or numbers on the number of records that they pressed. And what Alan Klein did was to go in and you know, I think it was one of the very first people to do that and to, to audit the pressing machines of, in the record companies. And he managed to find a lot of money, I think, for the Stones originally and then for the Beatles. Uh, I think Epstein, who was the Beatles' manager, it was, a, I think I'm right in saying, it was a source of um, irritation for Epstein that the Klein was the one who alighted on this. I think I got it right. And he came in and did an audit and both the Stones and the Beatles were, were missing lots of money and it was uh, restored to them. So... So I was, lots I of interesting, it was, it was, interesting little financial ring, wrinkles around the uh, around the music industry. It was it was Eastman. It was um, no, 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 East, no. That was Epst later. Epstein was dead when Klein came along. Was Ep he? Yeah, yeah. Right, so Klein, so Klein came in, came after, but it was Alan Klein. It was Alan Klein who who he first, took the money. Yeah, he first he first got involved. In auditing at the very beginning, yeah, I think Eastman that's came absolutely late. right. Came late. Yeah, Eastman came late. He, he, but but I think it was I think it was Paul McCartney who was who was sort of suspicious of Klein and Le, uh, Lennon, Harrison, and Ringo. Uh, they all they were all okay with Klein, and it was sort of John versus Paul. Like Paul wanted Linda's dad, and uh, John wanted Klein, and Klein was with the Stones. You and you're right in saying yeah, he was turned out to be a bit of a fishy character. <laughs> but he came in, he, you know, he, he exploited, if that's the right word, the, the, the lack of uh, audit and the lack of control on, on music royalties. Yeah, yeah. And well, I mean, the situation with music royalties today is, is, is a pretty uh, interesting and uh, a lot of musicians feel is quite a disgraceful um, one. But, you know, to a certain extent, reality is reality and there's not going to be much changing but as i understand it and i haven't followed it but you you know this better than i tom but um i understand this still it's still quite difficult to forecast what royalties are whether it's music royalties book royalties or whatever i mean it and the systems are still pretty antiquated mm. and artists artists still miss out i think on a fair amount of money yeah, I don't think I don't think people know what's due to them or, or what system yeah. is 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 used, and just the amounts amounts of money that get paid are smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where people don't even question being paid a, a literal pittance now. Um, it's it's strange. So in terms of this is quite a broad question, um, but 
the way society is moving and culture is moving in general, everything's becoming increasingly digitized. Um, and of course, you've achieved a huge amount of success in advertising, PR, media in general um, before this. So my question is, do you relish or resent the digitization of society and of culture? Well, I relish it. Um, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, the pandemic, has been a, a, a tragedy, obviously. More than th well over three million people in the official districts have lost their lives, um, and the official numbers must be higher. But you know what the pandemic has done is accelerated digitization, not just of uh, music, but you know, is it everything that the consumer does, whether it be buying essentials and groceries, educating their kids, buying their financial services online in home games and entertainment of which music is a part has accelerated the adoption of this at, at a consumer level. The second level uh, in media, and everything that was accelerating because of uh, the changes, you know, whether it's the demise of physical newspapers and magazines, uh, whether it's the demise of, uh, of analog billboards as opposed to digital billboards, whether it's the the uh, accelerated pressure, accelerating pressure on free-to-air TV, um, and the rise of the the acceleration of the rise of the streamers, whatever it is, so that's the second area that the pandemic has accelerated, and the last uh, is enterprises, enterprises that were hesitant to digitize their operations or transform their operations digitally. That all that has been accelerated by what's happened over the last year, and the the holes that were were driven into the P and Ls of companies uh, in the in the second quarter of last year, so this this time last year, you know, have given companies the opportunity, you know, as a result, we're going to be bad enough anyway to write off um, write off their costs. Of transforming digitally. So, what the pandemic has done, I don't think it's created new trends. It's accelerated trends that were there. You know, we, people talk about working from home and cities being under pressure and homeless. You know, take San Francisco. It was an expensive place to live. People were moving out of San Francisco. There were a lot of homeless people in South San Francisco. There was a lot of uh, disquiet about about the city before the pandemic, it's been accelerated by what's happened in the pandemic. And, you know, there are cities like San Francisco that are going to suffer as a result, I think. There are other cities probably that will benefit, you know, Denver or, uh, or cities in Colorado or Florida uh, will benefit as people move uh, around the United States, sometimes driven by tax as well, um, but, but by quality of living. So all the things that we now say more flexibility in work work versus home, more flexibility in commuting, more flexibility in living, more, more flexibility in working. All, all the, these trends were there already, but they're just accelerated by the pandemic. So um, no, I don't, I relish it. And you know, our business at S4 is built on digital. We are purely digital. We're a hundred percent digital. Do you think that being anything but 100% digital at some point in the not too distant future when it comes to this type of industry is going to actually be completely pointless uh, if you want to make any money. Well, I don't mind completely pointless. I mean, the, the thing for me is, you know, at the moment, digital is about 50% of the media market. Media market is about, well, 19 or 500, 550, let's say it was 500 billion, 525 billion last year. And this year it will grow by about seven or eight percent maybe more uh digital will be about 20 and traditional will be up a bit it's the digital part that's going to grow it was more than 50 percent for the first time last year and it's forecast digital's forecast to be 70 percent by 2026 uh, and clearly the issue is when you get to saturation when digital is 70 80 90 percent let's say uh, what do you do next? And we, so we have to find, we have to pivot over the next, let's say, by 2026, it's 70%. That's the forecast. 
of the media markets, which then leaves um, marketing services another 500 billion and trade budgets with 400 billion and another 700 billion. So the t- total addressable market for us is about 1.7 trillion. Now, once that's been sort of saturated, we have to pivot to other things. So that might be virtual reality, augmented reality, voice, you know, even thought. You know, there's this monkey <clears throat> that has been trained to think, and his thought or her thought um, determines um, what the, the reaction of the machine is, or the light, or the light. You know, I said, I, the monkey says switch on the light, and the light switches 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 on. So we're going to have neural um, neural marketing. Uh, we already have it to some degree. So there are going to be advances, and voice is another example. AR, VR. I mean, the virtual reality stuff we're doing, for example, with Facebook and Oculus already, is uh, you know becoming quite advanced. So a lot of things. So we have to find the next best thing. Um, uh, once once digitization or digital transformation or maybe it just carries on going but in different areas that's very interesting uh that you relish it what keeps you so motivated uh, don't mind me asking uh given the extreme level of success that you've achieved because well i wouldn't say extreme level i'm I'm 76 which means i'm an old man (laughs) i don't i don't want to retire it's my, so it's partly my mother's genes. My mother died when she was 90 and my father when he was 74. And I think they say your mother's genes has something to do with it. So I, 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 I owe it to her. That's one thing. Secondly, I didn't want to do portfolio stuff. I, I wanted to, I, I really relish, just like the growth of digital, I relish focusing on something. And thirdly, you know, I, when I left WPP, I, 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 I don't think, the, the board of WPP, particularly the chairman of WPP, was exactly very smart. He may think he's smart, but I don't think he was. And um, I think we have to demonstrate him that, that, that he was lacking in wisdom, if I put it politely. That's that's interesting. So you're <laughs> in part you're motivated by uh, a desire to prove something, despite uh, yes, no, it's no, proven no, that, already. That, that, that's fair. That's fair. You know. To prove, prove, I mean, WPP la- continues to languish. Um, you know, it's worth about 75% of what it was on the day that I left. And we've created $4 billion plus of value here at S4, and we're just at the beginning. So, you know, it's a, it's a, a clear demonstration that we, we, we know in part what we're, you know, we all make mistakes. Um, but in part, we know what we're doing. Because, you know, the biggest... The biggest challenge for any company is to adapt to what you've been talking about, to adapt, you know, in the music business, it's to adapt from what we were talking about before, you know, uh, black discs to digital music. You know, look at, uh, you know, what uh, Lucy and Grange has done with uh, with Universal. It's quite remarkable, the yeah. value that he's, he's created by understanding the changes that are taking place. You know, a lot of people said companies like Universal were dead a few years ago. And look what's what's happened there. And, you know, I think I saw somebody valuing it at well over 30 billion euros. And the, the Vivendi, its parent company, should be revalued on the basis of that. It's going to do an IPO. And they and Vincent Bolloré has sold, what, 20% to 10 cents for 6 billion. So... You know, on the basis of what ten cent paid for two lots of ten percent, it's worth thirty billion. Wow! And and uh, in terms of having to move with the times, and this particularly relates to music, but all creative arts. I'm very interested, and sorry for the randomness here, but what is your view of NFTs? Do you think that that's just a flash in the pan thing, and that's not even worth lingering on? Well, it, it, no, I, I think at, at, at the, the low end and high volume end, there's something there. I'm not sure that at the high end and at the, um, I mean, there is something there, clearly. It's a question about where it will have maximum impact and maximum value. And I think it will tend to have much more value 
uh, at small unit prices for large numbers of uh, NFTs, rather than you know you know paying millions of dollars for an, an NFT for, by Damien Hurst or whatever it happens to be. But I may be wrong. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, when you when you talk about digital coinage and um, Bitcoin, etc. You know, I, I, I sort of tune out on that. I'm a bit in the Buffett, Charlie Munger camp on, on that. <laughs> on, the, on the other hand, uh, blockchain technology, which brings, you know, principles and, you know, bring a publisher together with uh, a client without, you know, any intermediaries or with limited number of intermediaries, you know, that will be, will result in greater efficiency and the eradication of friction in the system, uh, often which you know causes a, a, there's a lack of transparency in the system. So the blockchain technology, I think, is really exciting and revolutionary, obviously, and and that will have massive impact. I am I am not so convinced of uh, you know digital currencies. If governments issue digital currencies, which I think they will. You know, that's obviously has tremendous repercussions, for example, a business like credit cards, and it has tremendous implications for other other forms of digital currency that are not state sponsored. So, so I think there will be massive changes in the system, but I'm not sure, you know, I don't know enough about NFTs to pass a judgment, but it seems to me just intuitively at high volume, low unit price, there could be quite something interesting there. Yeah, but not this sort of thing of treating, you know, I think no. you know, Jack Dorsey's first tweet selling for two million and all that sort of no, stuff. No, I, 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 don't, I don't think I, I would be the bit, I'd be the underbidder for that. <laughs> yeah, I think there are a lot of things that I'd rather buy for two million than Jack Dorsey's first tweet, but that's just me. Uh, and uh, uh, another couple of random uh, questions that I wanted to ask you are, what sure. is your opinion of... Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. <laughs> I really don't know enough about Gary to pass an opinion. You know, we sort of we sort of come a, a, a well because he he is pushing NFTs quite heavily. I remember seeing something with him, on, but I think he's pushing NFTs at um, the sort of in, in the sort of area that I'm I, I talked about, not necessarily the. The high yeah, price. yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. So, so you know, I think that sounds to me as though there's some there's some possible traction there. But I, I can't. I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about him. The detail, you know, I know what I read occasionally, but I don't know enough about you know what's really there. And and uh, another another quite random question because these these are all the sort of I'm I'm just asking about uh, powerhouses of of the modern media uh, landscape uh, and your opinion of them. Uh, that, that's that's a sort of a category of my line of question. Anyway, uh, what do you make of the boom of podcasting? Are you a fan of podcasts? I mean, obviously, apart from this one, which I you know you must be a huge fan of because you're on it. Uh, but what do you think of jo the likes of Joe Rogan? Do you think that that stuff? Is, is, yeah, I know, is, listen, I enjoy them. I, I don't know how much podcasts rely on lockdown and lockdown for, uh, phenomena. So we have to see, you know, a, a thing like Clubhouse, for them, which I used a couple of times uh, and, and enjoyed. I don't know whether that's a model that's going to survive uh, the opening up of the economy, um, which is a form of podcasting, really. Um, so... So the answer is, you know, voice and audio, obviously are very important. You know, when I walk to the office, uh, you know, which takes me about 20 minutes, uh, I will be listening to digital radio or I'll be listening to a podcast. Uh, so, you know, the answer is that I'm engaged and there are times or, you know, if I'm, I'm in the car, I would listen to it or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, I just, I don't know. Uh, to my mind, podcasting are a part, you know, it's a bit like influencer marketing. They're not in and of themselves an industry. They are part of a bigger whole. So they are, um, you know, a segment of the market. 
I don't think they're a market in themselves, if I can put it that way. So, mm-hmm. yeah, should you have a podcasting capability if you're in our, our industry? Yes. Should you have an influencer marketing capability? Yes. Should you build a global network of uh, influencers? I'm not so sure. I mean, you, you have a global capability, but do I think you can build a company just on influencer marketing? No. Do I think you could build a company just on podcasting? No. It's an element within a greater market segment. It's a sexy element. It's a growing element. But in of itself, it's not sufficient. It, you have to see it in, the, in, a, in a broader context. And you know, it's the same way, uh, I think, of influencer marketing. We have that capability. We, we have that capability inside S4 in, in terms of podcasting, but it's not in and of itself sufficient to build a business. That's, that seems very apt. But do you think that there are so many areas of marketing now that you could have a very specialized niche type of businesses focusing on these particular areas? Well, well, I think, you know, one of the the most important things if you're running or trying to run a company, build a company, is the addressable market. I think the addressable market, you know, I talk about the addressable market being 1.7, 1.8 trillion. That's 500 billion, 550 billion in media, about 500 billion in marketing services like public relations or data or whatever. And then another 700 billion in trade budgets, which are about 400 billion, plus another 300 in associate. That, that's an addressable market of 1.8 trillion. That's big enough to get, sink our teeth into. The, the, the question about picking out a, a smaller segment, whether it's podcasting or whether it's influencer marketing or whatever the devil it is, I, I don't think you want to do that. I, I don't think you want to narrow it down and narrow cast it. You want to broaden it. You know, if anything, if I, when I think about S4, we have two practices, one around content and the other around data and digital media. You know, we may add a third shortly, uh, but that, you know, it'll be related to what we do, but it will expand the addressable market very significantly. And that's the key. So it's like a bit you say saying to me about NFTs, you know, I, I don't know, but NFT could be the same phenomenon. It is a subset or a sub-segment, a segment of a broader market. And that, that's the way I think you have to look at it. So I think when you're running a company or trying to, you want to try and try and develop the addressable market as broadly as possible you can. And how do you stay personally up to date with this market? Uh, you, you were talking about podcasts and radio that you listen to. You know, what, for example, are your favorite podcasts related to business and current affairs, if any? Um, and, you, and digital I, radio. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I do like Scott Galloway. I mean, I, you know, Scott Galloway, a mile a minute. So I, 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 I listen to his stuff um, quite, quite attentively. And I don't have any great favorite. I mean, I, I pick stuff. Uh, there's some really interesting stuff that um, comes on Graydon Carter's uh, weekly airmail. I mean, he he highlights there was a really interesting set of podcasts on Jelaine Maxwell and Robert Maxwell. Um, so you, I don't have you know, I don't go, I don't have a regular. It's not like Newsnight or Squawk Box or whatever where I necessarily go and uh, for for a podcast um, um, sort of immersion, what I, what I look for is stuff that I'm interested in. So I don't have, a, you know, one, but Scott Galloway maybe I listen to on a fairly frequent basis because I think he's always very good value and he crams so much into, you know, 30 minutes. I mean, he's, he crams too much in, so much that you can never... Uh, you know, you can never absorb what he has to say. But, um, yeah, I think that, that that's what I really look for. I look for subjects that I'm interested in, find amusing, interesting, often recommended. I mean, uh, Graydon Carter does a very good job of recommending good stuff, actually. Um, so it varies. I don't have a, I wouldn't say I go to, you know, one source uh, in particular. 
And you are somebody who's been incredibly successful at scaling uh, a, a business. Uh, do you think that, I mean, do you think that scaling a business today is easier than it's ever been? Uh, no, I think it's actually probably more difficult than it's ever been because of US-China friction. And so you, you have the two biggest economies in the world at odds. You know, when I was trying to run WPP, it was relatively easy. I mean, we had wonderful, you know, we, we happened on JWT, Ogilvy, YNR and Gray, all who had businesses in India and China, and we put them together sort of thing. Didn't put them together enough, but we... We had them, so we had 20% share in China, market share and 50% in India. So in, in, today, because of the friction between the world's biggest economy at 24 trillion out of 75 trillion and the world's second biggest economy, which is what, 14 trillion out of 75 trillion, you, you have an inherent conflict and clash, which makes life, thank you very much, um, which makes life much more difficult. So I would say on, on scaling geographically, there are two buckets, geography and technology. Scaling a business geographically today is more difficult than it was when I was trying it with, with WPP or with Sarches. And the principal reason is relationships between the US and China have deteriorated and they deteriorated under Obama but particularly under Trump, and they don't look like they're going to get much better under Biden. And, you know, a lot of flashpoints, whether it's uh, Hong Kong, and, and Xi, Xi, President Xi, has been, you know, there for almost 10 years already, will be there until, what, uh, 2035, along with probably with Vladimir Putin. Um, the, these rifts make global, global development more difficult, and of course, global development is difficult, more difficult anyway, because we've seen you know, the impact of the pandemic on the global supply chains. We've seen the, the rise of populism, I think principally because of inequality, you know, which has been happening since the mid 80s, since Reagan and Thatcher. So the world has become a more divided place rather than a, a more uniform place, which I think is, is a is a sad thing, um, but, but so it's more difficult from a geographical point of view. On the other hand, technology, of course, has been able to link us up much more effectively than it was, was able to do when I was trying to run WPP or such. So it swings and roundabouts, but I, I think on balance, that political problem, that relationship problem is a huge issue and as I look at trying to develop, you know, we're 70%, S4 is 70% North and South America, 20% EMEA and 10% Asia, and we want to be 40, 20, 40. Uh, I think that will happen, but it's going to be much more difficult to execute than it was when I was trying to do it a few, few years ago, when, you know, Deng, Deng Xiaoping had, had made his speech in 1985. I went to China in 90, roughly the same time. And the rest was history. We built a colossal business that had 16,000 people in China and about the same number in India. And, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to do that again, but I think it's going to be much more difficult. We doubled up in China recently, in Shanghai. Uh, we're, we're building a new studio, uh, Epic, Fortnite, Unreal Engine Technologies. Uh, we're, we're building in, uh, in New Delhi in the old CNBC TV 18 studio. So we're doing, we're doing a lot, but you know, we haven't got the scale yet that I'd like to have in those, those two markets, but it's much more difficult. I think it was before. Um, you know, it, it's a sort of a, a contradiction really, because technology has enabled us to be much, much closer, but you know, you see what's happening with regulation. You see, you know, Google question marks about Google and Facebook and Amazon in the West. And then you see, what's happening with Ant Financial and Alibaba, and you see what's happening with Tencent and TikTok uh, in the East. I mean, the Chinese government is clearly worried about the power that some of these platforms have and the political power. I mean, clearly Jack Ma ran afoul of that. And so it's very, it's difficult, very difficult, very different 
different, um, but exciting and interesting and finding a way. So, you know, the Chinese are much more, you know, it's make, make China great again. China was great a couple of hundred years ago. It's going to be the biggest economy in the planet, on the planet. It's something that the Americans and, and the Westerners find very difficult to be comfortable with. The rise of India is going to make people, uh, the continued rise of India is going to make people uncomfortable. Um, so it's really addressing that. And maybe you have to figure out a new structure in a Chinese environment where even the millennials are more in favor uh, of, uh, you know, you always think, thought the Chinese millennials would be in favor of the West and Western values and things, but that's not the case. I mean, we, we, we are noticing that Chinese companies like to deal with Chinese companies. And you talked earlier about the pandemic and its effects. Do you think that the re reopening of economies is going to like slow down the way trends are accelerating? No, 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 the opposite. I mean, the, 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 um, the snapback is huge. Um, you know, GDP growth, I can't remember the last time that GDP growth um, for two years sequentially was at what, six to seven this year or five to six this year and four to five next year. No, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. So the growth, the growth is really strong, and it, it's going to get it's going to get stronger in 21, 22. If you're asking me, what do I worry about? I worry about when the rubber hits the road in 23, and things slow down a bit, uh, GDP wise. Uh, I don't think that's going to be a, uh, a real problem for us because we'll have the tailwind. There are two tailwinds we have digital transformation and GDP growth. And when GDP growth slows, like we saw last year, digital transformation continues. So that those digital trends will continue. I mean, it's a bit like SARS in China. Um, Alan Joby Yunlib always tells the story or tells the story that the Chinese consumer changed when, uh, when um, SARS hit and they were using online more and they didn't go back to using analog forms of distribution they used the online forms of distribution same thing is going to be true here i think and you also spoke earlier about people being concerned about the power of the social media companies is this obviously you you know you can't predict the future but do you think that just on a hunch or or for any more kind of calculated reason uh do you think that companies like Instagram and Facebook will be around forever, you know, uh, or for the next 50 yeah, yeah, years, I, as big as they I are now? They will, I think they will be forever and they will continue to, to grow, grow. And, uh, but their growth will probably be more organic than, uh, than it will be by deals. I think regulators don't, don't want to see them necessarily getting bigger. Um, and therefore it will be more difficult for them to do deals. Uh, on the other hand, stopping their organic growth is going to be rather difficult. You know, look at it this year. Google's ad revenues may go from 180 to 240 billion. If you extrapolate what happened in Q1, Facebook goes from 80 to 110, and Amazon goes from at least probably around 20 to at least 30. So that's a hundred, a hundred billion increase in ad revenues for a start. Now that partly comes from traditional and analog, but it also comes from new users. users and, and often in those cases, it's small and medium sized um, companies. So the answer to your question is, is that, you know, I think those companies will inevitably get bigger, but they're gonna get bigger through organic means, not necessarily through uh, through deals. You know, the, the um, the, the, the regulatory authorities, whether it be the Department of Justice or the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission will, will, will look very carefully at the expansion, I think, through deals, uh, but, but organic growth will, will continue. So, you know, if, if, I, if I were you, you know, I would buy a few shares and tuck them away and forget about them. <laughs> and will there ever be a situation where those companies are under threat in a similar manner that, you know, 
MySpace or whatever back in the day used to be a big, big thing. And well, we're a bit far gone from that now, aren't we? Yeah, just a little bit, Tom. I, mean, <laughs> no, no. I think the comparison is a little bit ridiculous. Um, yes, well, because you're talking about companies that have got now. You know, if you look to the top twenty companies by market cap or top ten today, as opposed to forty years ago, you know, definitely, definitely different, different composition. And there's no reason why technological change, you know, should should lessen it or it'll intensify. So you are going to get more and more changes. But I think the strength, you know, these are one trillion, two trillion dollar companies. And um, as I said, I think the, the biggest pressure on them will be on deals. Um, but you know, organic growth, you know, as as online digital transformation continues to develop uh, and, and you know, if you see what's happened as a result of the pandemic, it's huge. That will continue to be the case. Yeah, that's that, that seems irrefutable. And I mean, the reason why I was saying it about, I mean, it is a kind of ridiculous line of questioning to pursue about, you know, how MySpace was a thing. So will uh, will one of these social media platforms ever fall off? You know, would Twitter ever become kind of less relevant i know that you know twitter's not well, like think, the same league think, as you, the others you, you, you've got to be, you, yeah you can't lump them all together right there are six platforms which are dominant yeah the three western and three yeah. now you say you know twitter twitter's ad revenues are less than a billion i mean half a billion it's a totally snap, different company to the yeah, others yeah yeah snap has done extremely well you know grew last year by 63 percent i think it was said at the capital markets day it's going to go up by 50 percent no you know i mean they're all they're doing what pinterest you know less than a billion dollars whatever so you're, you're talking it's chalk and cheese so yeah you know, just remember the number 180 billion to 240 for google 80 to 110 for facebook 20 to 30 35 maybe for amazon so you know again in comparison, the others are minnows. Mm. And where does TikTok fall into it? Well, TikTok is, you know, about 7 billion um, in 2019. I don't know what their figure was in 20. And TikTok, TikTok's ad revenues were about 7 billion and purely Chinese. They weren't outside China at that stage. But, the, you know, that they hired Kevin Mayer to try and do that. That didn't work out, as you know. So they they will come, and but they had the problem with the Americans. That still hasn't been resolved as to what happens to TikTok internationally. I think I think they're establishing an international headquarters outside China. But these are you know that's again it's it's TikTok is the one that's made the breakthrough mm. to get to seven, which is considerably more. You know it's running at about three times more than. Uh, than snap but but none of those kind of i mean tiktok might be different but none of those kind of fringe companies really at this point will stand no, 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 not the, a big the company gut, like the, the other guts the guts of the business around google facebook amazon tencent alibaba and tiktok by dance those are the gut, that's the guts is there any uh modern act modern pop star modern singer whatever uh, who who you can recall being impressed by recently well they're, they're all they're all in, in pre, impressive i mean i still you know you go back to your to your youth so it would be i mean it'd be really boring isn't it it's beatles and rolling stones isn't it it's when you were when you were 18 19 and 20 those are the things that really live with you uh for forever so I, I would always hark back to those actually those will be the ones that uh, that made the greatest impression and when you were when i was at university whether it be in the uk or the us that, that would be where probably it had the biggest impact yeah well that, that's what i'm finding more and more speaking to people on this that, that it's that type of age that people pick up the music well that's because you that's because you're probably talking to older people like me oh no, oh, no. 
old, old farts as opposed to youngsters. And that's probably it. But, uh, we, I we, speak all, we, all, we all like to reminisce. But those, those are the things that make, you know, again, it comes back to that question in the Google, uh, the Google magazine. You know, what is the music that moves you? And that's what you, what you remember. Um, mm. you know, Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane. I mean, all those those people you remember because that was when probably you know I had more time, um, but you were more impressionable, and so there was there was the jazz, and then there was the the the, the modern music, which you know, was dominated by. The, all the Detroit sounds as well. I mean, those were all things that we we all responded to. But you know, if you ask me to name a couple, it would tend to be those that I named. Well, they they're certainly not choices to be snipped at because mine would be pretty similar. Uh, <laughs> well, so what what are yours? What are well, yours? it would be Beatles? I, I'm just I'm just a, another simple vanilla scholar of the Beatles. You know, that's it for me. <laughs> That's Nothing else. Nothing uh, else. Beatles, Beatles and Elton. But uh and then then it would be too broad after that. Uh all, all different areas and genres. But if it was the, the the desert island, I could get by with just the Beatles and Elton John. If you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.